following program is from NET. Can black people survive culturally and physically in America? Can we ever be a part of the existing white institutions? Or should we be developing our own? Can we as a people develop solutions to our dilemma fast enough to counteract the present rate of growth of the oppressive factors built into this society by institutional white racism? As black people, we must deal with the issue. Is it too late? Tonight on Black Journal, Reverend Ralph Abernathy, Imamu Amidi Baraka, Dr. James Chief, Reverend Albert Clay, Congressman Charles Diggs, Jr., Mr. Dick Gregory, Miss Dorothy Height, Mr. Roy Ennis, Mr. Vernon Jordan, Dr. John Morsell. What is the present condition of black America? And what will black America's future be? Or will there be a future black America? In essence, is it too late? This special Black Journal program is designed to discuss that complicated question. For the next 90 minutes, we will present a live, unedited, two-way communication system between you and our Congress of Black Spokesmen. We will be using television as an instrument of positive social reform, allowing Black America, for the first time, to question members of her leadership and make herself heard collectively. This program is being aired live only in the Eastern and Central time zones. By calling regional phone-in centers in eight cities, you can address questions to our assembled panel. Answering these phones are members of the Friends of Black Journal. You can call the regional number nearest you, and in the East, the regional area code and numbers are, for the Boston area, 617-491-5600. For the New York area, 212-765-5960. For the Washington, D.C. area, 202-628-1222. In the Midwest, the area codes and numbers are, for the Chicago area, 312-591-6400. For the Cincinnati area, 513-651. 621-7200. For the Detroit area, 313-871-8700. In the South, the area codes and numbers are, for the New Orleans area, 504-486-5511. For the St. Louis area, 314-725-2400. We do appreciate your patience. Please understand that we cannot use all of the questions we receive, but every effort will be made to use as many as possible. We are also thankful to the members of the panel for accepting this invitation, understanding that their allotted time for discussion will be less than they are normally accorded in television appearances. We have asked that their responses be as brief as possible. This is our first attempt in the Black Journal series at using television for a live two-way communication, but we do not intend it to be the last. Indeed, there are many other black spokesmen, but our physical and technical capabilities have limited us. We do want the public to understand that our black leadership does include persons not on this panel. Sister Fannie Lou Hamer, president of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, was scheduled to appear with us and has suddenly and unfortunately been hospitalized. She sends her regrets and her love. In selecting tonight's panel, we attempted to bring together a diversity of positions and philosophies held together by the common thread of concern for all black people. The St. Louis Argus, a black community paper, describes this event as follows. I quote, all over America, black men and women of purpose will be sitting down with their children to view this historic program to ponder on its message, to listen, to learn, to go forward. 
Each panelist will now make a brief opening statement, after which we will place your questions before them. Reverend Ralph D. Abernathy, President, Southern Christian Leadership Council. The Southern Christian Leadership Conference, known to many throughout our nation as SCLC, is that organization that was founded by Martin Luther King, Jr., and used as an instrument to redeem the soul of America. SCLC is now a national organization working across the South and in the major cities of the North for the rights and the needs of black and poor people. Basically, we organize masses of people in nonviolent community action movements and programs. We're working for the total liberation of black people through economic development and control of our black communities. We believe in amassing the collective power of blacks, other minorities, all people, and progressive forces. We seek a radical change in our national priorities, a redistribution of wealth and power and the creation of a nation of peace and human decency. We also seek to develop and to strengthen our international ties to movements of other people across the world. SCLC is that organization that will see to it that America feeds its hungry, house its ill house, provide adequate medical care for all of its citizens, and live up to its pronouncements and its dream. Imamu Amidi Baraka, Executive Committee, Congress of African People. The Congress of African People is a Pan-African nationalist organization that is, we believe in the unification of black people, Africans, wherever we are in the world. We also believe that we will not survive and develop unless we are able, through unity, to achieve self-determination, self-respect, self-reliance, and self-defense. We also work to unify diverse groups of black people, African people. We believe that there should be unity without uniformity, that all black groups must be able to work together around common purposes. Before I continue, I would like to uh, state that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is with us by phone from his home and uh, along with him is Minister Louis Farrakhan. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad will, at the end of the visible panel, make a position statement by phone from his home. Our next statement will be made by Dr. James Cheek, President of Howard University. One of the major issues facing our nation in this decade <clears throat> is the issue of quality education. Many Americans, black and white, assume that quality education can occur only through integration where integration has come to mean the destruction of cl or closing of black colleges and institutions of learning and black students enrolling in predominantly white institutions. At the level of higher education, that is beyond high school, this attitude enacted into public policy has resulted in the continuous deterioration of one of the nation's most important, most strategic, and most essential groups of institutions the black colleges and universities. After more than a century of service in educating and training most of the nation's black college trained population, these institutions have experienced during the past 10 years serious erosions in their resources which have seriously affected the quality of their services and which today threaten their vitality and from a number of standpoints threatened their continued existence. Unless a major national effort is launched to change the public attitude toward the black colleges and universities and to provide for them substantial sums of financial support, many of them will not exist by 1980. And those that do survive will have become either predominantly white in student body and faculty are so poor in quality as to render them meaningless as collegiate-level institutions. In such an event, 
America's black population will be deprived of a major resource that is essential in our efforts to achieve for ourselves and the nation as a whole through social justice. The destruction and impoverishment of black colleges and universities will contribute to the destruction of any possibility of this nation achieving true democracy, true freedom, true equality, and true justice. It will be a national tragedy if America, through indifference, disinterest, and outright bigotry, allows the black institutions of this country to become academic wastelands. It is very clear that the development of strong and distinguished black institutions, not simply the inclusion of blacks in white institutions, is indispensable for the attainment of racial equality in this society. Reverend Albert B. Clegg, Jr., Chairman, Black Christian Nationalist Movement. I represent the Black Christian Nationalist Movement, and I state the Black Christian Nationalist Movement's position. We feel that it could very well be too late for the black man in America. Probably the next five or ten years will indicate whether or not the black man can survive. Our struggle for survival is a very real struggle, and the white man has prepared genocide for black people. Unemployment, the black man is no longer necessary. Unemployment is going to be a way of life for black people. We are going to face increasing dangers and problems as the days pass, and we're totally unequipped as black people to deal with them. We're a part of a slave culture. We have no preparation. We have no black institutions capable of dealing with white racist institutions designed to serve only white people. We must deal with the problem that confronts black people by building black institutions, by understanding that only a separate disposition is a viable position for black people. Any organization or any leader in America who today advocates integration is a foe and an enemy of black people and their survival in the coming years. Representative Charles C. Diggs, Jr., Democrat, Michigan, and Chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus. The United States is the second largest black nation in the world. The West African nation of Nigeria uh, ranks first, having a population of over 60 million blacks, uh, which more than doubles our own. The Congressional Black Caucus, composed of the 13 black members of the U.S. House Representatives, believes that uh, we are on the threshold of a new era of political power for blacks, uh, not only in America, but in Africa and in the Caribbean area. There is a kind of, of, of heightened solidarity among black people uh, now who are, are becoming more conscious of the intricacies of politics uh, as an instrument for change. Uh, we are witnessing the emergence of a, of a, of a kind of, of, of nationalism, uh, of a kind of, of black awareness that has spilled over into the political arena on an international scale and the Congressional Black Caucus is committed to that kind of objective. Mr. Dick Gregory, social commentator. <clears throat> is it too late? <laughs> it could be if America insists on dealing with her problems with might instead of solving problems with right. It could be too late if America insists on fighting a sick, degenerate, insane war in Vietnam and not deal with the sick, insane problems that confronts Americans. <laughs> it could be too late if America insists at this day and age that we are to run around the world to guarantee foreigners a better way of life than we guarantee our own Indian brothers who we have locked up on the reservation who she stole this country from. Is it too late? It could be too late if America insists on solving her problems with political muscle instead of statesmanship ability. Ms. Dorothy Height, President, National Council of Negro Women. Black women face the double handicap of racism and sexism. And Mary McLeod Bethune recognized this as far back as 1935 when she founded the National Council of Negro Women because she realized that the black woman, whether she was trained or untrained, 
stood outside of the mainstream of American opportunity, influence, and power. The National Council of Negro Women has encouraged black women to assume leadership roles and to serve as catalysts for social change. Today, as a coalition of 25 national organizations, we've realized that it is too late to have divisions. Women from all walks of life, different ages, political persuasion, social and economic backgrounds are mobilized to help increase the strength of the black family and the whole black community. The work of the National Council of Negro Women is based on a philosophy that I think could be expressed in three words, commitment, unity, and self-reliance. And the energy of its woman power is harnessed to fight such chronic inequities as racism itself, inadequate education and substandard housing, hunger and malnutrition, insufficient child care, drug addiction, the lack of economic opportunities, especially for women and their families in the rural South, and the demeaning conditions com facing so many of us as household workers. It is late. It's too late to think about a matriarchy. It is the time to think about the unity of the whole family. And women of the National Council of Negro Women feel that in this day, black women can make a difference for justice and liberation. Mr. Roy Innes, National Director, Congress of Racial Equality. The Congress of Racial Equality is a nationalist pan-Africanist organization of the Gaviite variety. We feel the survival of black America is threatened by racial schizophrenia that plagues a great portion of black leadership. Malcolm called this problem the problem of the house nigger against the field nigger. Its destructive ramifications exist yet today. Black masses are governed and led by an elite few who have split loyalties between their black and white families. These racial schizoids are leading us down the path of racial genocide through the propagation of forced integration and the calculated assimilation. Black people could very well disappear as a people and certainly lose all prospect for black political, economic, and social power and unity. I say this feeling a profound sorrow and a heartfelt concern for destruction looms critically before us unless we meet head on the problem of the white imposed leadership of the mulatto aristocracy and their Bantu lackeys. Core will not shirk its responsibilities to reveal this truth and expose this conspiracy against black people. <clears throat> Mr. Vernon E. Jordan, Jr., Executive Director, National Urban League. The National Urban League believes in a pluralistic, open society, one in which black people have the same range of choices and options as any other citizen. The Urban League's action programs are carried out by 100 affiliates across the country, and they serve the minority community that is in need of our programs and our community organization projects. We believe that a necessary precondition for an open society is the presence of a strong, of strong black institutions and the achievement of economic parity. We say it is not too late for black people to get themselves together and to join with others, blacks, browns, and whites, to bring about the necessary restructuring of our society. We believe it is not too late to realize the political and economic empowerment of black people and thus to achieve parity with those whose skin is white, whose opportunities have not been withheld, and whose progress has been steady. Dr. John A. Morsell, Assistant Executive Director, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. When the NAACP was established some 63 years ago, a number of leading authorities in this field declined to join with it because they said it was impossible that black people could survive 50 years in this country under the conditions then prevailing. 63 years of history has passed. 
And like my organization, I am dedicated to the proposition that it is still possible to achieve genuine racial justice and meaningful equality among black and white Americans through the social and governmental structures we now have, modified as needed through the democratic process. I believe that the goal of an integrated society nourished and formed by healthy cultural diversity is still attainable. I also believe that there is no guarantee that we will be successful, but I'm convinced that if we have any chance at all, it is along the road which seeks a common American destiny and insists upon a partnership of equals along the way. The uh, statement for the Nation of Islam will now be made by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad by phone from his home. Go ahead, please. Opening statement of the Nation of Islam by the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Go ahead, please. Avenue, 
like I was a king or queen, pardon me saying queen, like if I was a prince for a new government somewhere else. I think the white people, they did a wonderful honor to me twice that I visit Washington. They have never disgraced me in the way of trying to mock me as a messenger. No, they honored me, and I thank them for the honor they give to me that my black people never dared to do, out of Washington or in Washington. So this is true, that they know more about me than my own people. They know that God helped raise me up to teach the truth. They don't argue with me about it. They don't try to mock me, disgrace me. They are very nice to me. But it's my black people that is the one who does the mocking and disgracing they try to do. But I want to say this, and this is it is true. You cannot disgrace a true servant of God. You disgrace yourself. I don't say this trying to uh, say anything against too late. I am coming to that and right. It is too late for us to go to work to try to be equal in politics with the white man. You cannot be equal with him in politics that he has made himself. You cannot go and get beside him if he gave it to you in office in Washington to be the <coughs> equal with the white man while you don't know while he knows. He makes them himself. I say we need to make politics of our own. If we want politics, make them of your own. We cannot use his politics because that they are made up of his know-how for self. And this thing that we are after today is something for self and not something for the white man that who has 6,000 years to have made his world, and he has made it. There is no doubt he didn't lose one minute in making him a world. But we are this poor slaves who has been trodden down by the white race in trying to do something for self. We have not did nothing for self. I want the big white people to do something for us. I don't give two cents for a black man laying around Washington, Chicago, San Francisco, anywhere in the country, begging white folks to do something for him. Get out and do something for yourself. He said you are free. Take advantage of this freedom. He said that you can go for self. Go for self, black man. What's hindering you if he boldly tell you in the world to go for yourself? We are trying to go for ourselves, we Muslims. We are trying to dignify America wherever we stay. Uh, pardon the English, wherever we live. We're trying to dignify the country. We're not trying to make the country look ugly. We're trying to make the country to look beautiful because we are living in it and we want to live wherever we live, to be beautiful. We're trying to do something for ourselves and we are trying to teach our people to do something for self. We're not trying to be with the politicians Black people, we are not trying 
to out preach you, brother. We just want to preach the truth. That's all we want to do. Again, we are trying to farm. You may not like farming, but from farming comes everything that we get. Therefore, we're trying to farm. I am begging you all over the country to come in and to help. Do these things which I know that you will love me for teaching you to do these things pretty soon. We cannot depend on the wheat house of America. We cannot depend on the, the livestock of America, we got to depend on something for self. Let us go to the good old earth. If the white man will sell it or read it or lease it to us, and they get out of that earth what he has gotten out of it. We no more must do these things about laying around begging the white man for this and that. And I said to the preachers, preach the gospel of doing for self. And don't preach the gospel of begging. This is a shame for us after 400 years and 100 years up from slavery to go and beg white people to give us anything. Go get it ourselves. It's out here. I help here on the south side of Chicago with the help of my followers have did things that you never dreamed of doing. We have a program of what we're going to do for the south side in Chicago to show to you in our paper now within a week or so. And you will be happy. We want you. Unemployment is bound to overtake you. I said to you, hunger is bound to overtake you. I said to you, revolution is bound to take overtake you. All kinds of bad weather that you have never dreamed of bound to overtake you. We are in the throes of divine destruction no. of America. Don't think that America is now setting free of these things. She's in them. Mr. Muhammad? Mr. Muhammad, can you hear me? Best way is that you try and join on to Islam. Islam is, is the salvation of the black man in America. Join on to it. Thank you. That was the... Uh, statement from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Again, we invite your questions uh, to this distinguished panel. Make note of the phone-in center nearest you. In the east, the regional numbers are in Boston, in the Boston area, 617-491-5600. In New York area, 212-765-5960. Washington, D.C. area, 202-628-1222. Chicago area in the Midwest, 312-591-6400. Cincinnati area, 513-621-7200. In the Detroit area, 313-871-8700. And in the south, the numbers and the area codes are in the New Orleans area, 504-486-5511. St. Louis area, 314-725-2460. We have quite a few uh, questions and we'd like to progress as rapidly as possible. First question is from New York City for Reverend Abernathy. Would you categorize the struggle between yourself and Reverend Jackson as a power struggle between black men? Well, there is no struggle between myself and the Reverend Jackson. As you will recall, Reverend Jackson served as a staff member of Southern Christian Leadership Conference. And he did an excellent job, I think, in that capacity as the director of our department, Operation Breadbasket. And when he could no longer carry out the orders of our organization and be governed by the organization, uh, he resigned, he quit, 
and I understand that he has established now his own organization. There is no power structure between Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson. I'm fighting so that America will feed its hungry, house its ill house, care for the sick and the needy in the war in Vietnam, solve our domestic problems here at home, stop spending billions for the moon, and only pennies for the poor. This is our program in SCLC. Thank you. The next question. Sure. I, I don't care about, a, you know, the whole concept of a power struggle between two black folks. Neither one having any power is absolutely ridiculous and points out the basic problem that confronts all organizations that have been speaking here other than CORE. Even the, the, the Muslim harangue did not deal with the basic problem of the black man's powerlessness. Black people don't have any power. Abernathy and Jesse Jackson can wrestle from here to, to, to uh, Los Angeles. They're still not dealing with power. Black people are powerless. They've been put outside of the whole white power structure. And all the organizations, the NAACP, Urban League, SCLC, National Council, Negro Women, all of them are talking as though black people have power. Black people don't have any power. Unless we can begin to build black institutions and realize that we're dealing with a power struggle for survival, all these organizations are leading us straight to hell and genocide. And Doc, uh, Dr. Abernathy ought to understand it couldn't be a power struggle because neither one of them have any power. NAACP has no power. Urban League has no power. No black organization, no black people in America have power. They're fighting for survival from a powerless position, flat on their back, begging white folks. And that's, that was almost uh, the tenor of the Muslim position. They were begging white folks, please, Please sell us some land, give us some land, let us exist. White folks are good. That's a self-hate kind of thing that black folks find themselves degenerating into because black people have no power and they have to beg white folks to give them whatever they want. And I say black people and black Christian nationalism says we have to approach the whole problem in terms of power. Black people have to begin to build institutions. Every institution that exists belongs to white people, was built by white people, and serves the interests of white people. And for black organizational leaders to be sitting there talking as though they have power, as though they represent something, we want to represent everybody, we want to bring everybody together, we want to build a beautiful America. We don't want to build no kind of beautiful America. We want power for black people, and we're going to have to fight for it. It demands confrontation and the willingness to do anything necessary to get power. And we've got to take it away from white people. White people are not going to give black people anything. Politically, economically, or any other way, black man is no longer necessary in America. And the white man is hell-bent on genocide. So we have to understand we've got to build institutional power to deal with the white man who has decided to destroy it. Oh, thank you, Reverend, for underscoring my point yes. that this is merely a gimmick on the part of a white racist society to divide black people. Right. There is no power structure be struggle between Ralph Abernathy and Jesse Jackson. Thank you. I'd like to proceed, if I can, uh, and if you could keep your questions as brief as possible, but I know you need time to develop them. Uh, the next question is for uh, Dick Gregory. What is being done about sickle cell anemia uh, and what can black people do to help? This comes from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I think one thing what we got to do is develop ways and means of doing some basic research to find out, one, the origin of sickle cell anemia was uh, a sickle-like shaped cell in the blood that guarded black folks against malaria. And when we were brought to this country, and got on the high grease, high starch diet that we on, it created problems, which was once a protection. And so the millions of dollars we fixing to spend to counteract sickle cell, if we would spend a little time doing some research and change the diet, because most black folks knew that soul food was taking 30 to 40 years off of their life and almost charging them a third of their salary for doctors and what have you, a lot of sicknesses we die from, we wouldn't. And I think the important structure of the black man's health, be it sickle cell or anything else, lies basically with the diet because you are what you eat. Thank you. We now have an on-the-air call from Cincinnati, Ohio. Would you go ahead, please? A caller from Cincinnati, Ohio. You're on the air. Would you go ahead, please? difficulties. 
We have a uh, call, uh, a message here, question for any member of the panel. Does the panel think the Democratic Party can serve as a tool for the liberation of black people, or should it be necessary to create a new political party? I'll add, no political party can serve as a tool if it's dominated by white people. Black people have to build their own institutions, their own institutional power base from which to work. And the only possible power base that black people have is the black church, which has to be restructured. Its orientation has to be taken out of the clouds and begin to build on earth a kind of a nation of black people here on earth who are dealing with reality in a programmatic kind of way. Uh, would uh, Mr. Barack or Congressman Diggs like to speak to that since you're involved in the political convention? The National Black Political Convention, which takes place in Gary, Indiana, March 10th through March 12th, will be addressing itself to the empowerment of black people uh, through uh, this kind of an instrument, uh, without any uh, uh, reference to partisanship. Uh, and I, I think that it, it is consistent with the implications uh, of that question, because uh, without uh, uh, confrontation with both political parties and outside of the political party, uh, uh, political structure, uh, obviously we're not going to be able to translate what, uh, what uh, represents our potential power into anything meaningful. Mr. Baraka, you want to respond to that? Yes. Um, our basic position is that first thing we have to realize that we are a people, a particular people, that we are not uh, Americans except by default of being here in the same space. But what we have to realize and what we are trying to uh, articulate is that I think almost all of our brothers here have a correct position to a certain extent, uh, from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to uh, Brother Clegg to uh, Congressman Diggs, that our problem is that we seem to think that the diversity of our beliefs is uh, somehow has to keep us apart. That I think when we learn to, that the in, it is institutions, alternative institutions, that will be our salvation. But we have to be able to, to orchestrate our community, that is to pull together a kind of unified national black community so that the the Christian nationalists, or the Christians, or the Muslims, or the people who are talking about integration, or the people who are talking about Garveyism, that somehow we can function as a nation of people, as a people. That we can sit, just like we're sitting here and uh, say to each other, try to agree on certain things that we have to do as a people. So that, say, we can agree that the Christian nationalists and the Muslims and the, you know, people who are politically motivated, that say on one issue, we can get together and deal with that particular issue from the point of our collective strength because uh, we don't have any power because we have not focused and created an instrument through which to translate our power potential into actuality. Any well, such instrument would be wholly dishonest unless we are able to come together and admit our diversities and identify them for us to stop lying about what we are. We have a serious problem in this country among black leaders wherein very few these days would honestly call themselves integrationists while pursuing that path uh, with all of their energies and, and, and resources. We need to be able to admit our diversities, identify them, then there might be a chance to come together in some kind of instrument. Uh, we now have, uh, yes, uh, Dr. Morris. I'd like to make a brief, uh, quick comment. I hope it would have the effect in part of bringing our discussion back into a reality of the here and now. Now, I have no quarrel with people who want to engage in philosophical speculations about the ultimate culture and the ultimate this and the ultimate that. But I call attention to the fact that we are a minority of 10 or 11 percent living right here and now in the United States in the midst of institutions in which it is certainly true we have very little power. It seems to me that while some are pursuing the long-range goals in one direction or another, that they, that some of which have been enunciated here, somebody has got to be, in effect, minding the store and seeing that the problems of black people who are hungry in Mississippi and Alabama are being met, that they're being fed, as our emergency relief program is doing, as Dorothy Heights uh, Council's program is doing. Somebody has got to see about finding jobs, about seeing people are trained for jobs, because no matter what system we have, people are going to work by the sweat of their brow, and that's the way they're going to earn their bread. They're going to have to know how to work and how to work skillfully and well. 
And these are problems to which we have to address ourselves. Now, uh, Imamu uh, Baraka has, has, has notably, in Newark, operated on this level. I'm quite sure that his views as to the ultimate future of black people are very different from mine. And God will only tell, some years hence, who is right. But he works to get people registered to vote in the city of Newark so that they can use some of the power. If people are powerless in Newark, in part at least, it's because they don't use what power channels they have. And I think we need to address ourselves to the ways in which we can build unity on specific problems, specific needs where there is analysis and action. May I say this, uh, because, so we won't get bogged down in, in our differences and in having an argumentation over our organizational philosophy. We have literally thousands of people who are phoning. And I would certainly appreciate uh, if you could respond directly to the questions and please respond as succinctly as possible. We have just, we're just overwhelmed with phone calls. Thank you very much. We now have a live call uh, from a viewer from Cincinnati. Uh, would the viewer from uh, Cincinnati go ahead, please? Yes. As an interested citizen, what appears to be uh, the best and most, perhaps the most logical position to take concerning the 1972 presidential election? The panel likes to respond to that. She wanted to know what the most sensible position would be uh, in the 1972 election. To vote for that candidate who can openly come out and recognize the diversity among black people and be willing to put together a platform that can satisfy the diverse interests of the various black groups. Thank you. The next uh, uh, question is for Dr. Cheek. What goals should black students seek at this time in order to succeed in today's society? That's from Brooklyn, New York. I think one of the most important things is for black students to assure themselves that they are receiving a kind of education that will make them competent to function in this society as well as competent to change it. The next call is from Cincinnati, Ohio for Ms. Height. Do you think if there were ever, do you think there will ever be racial pluralism in American society? And if so, how soon? Well, I think there is, uh, <clears throat> actually, the myth of the melting pot has uh, led us down very sad paths. But that there will be pluralism when we recognize the contribution of every group. And I think that is why it seems to be when black people are talking about our contribution, that we are trying to make America uh, more of a pluralistic society by recognizing the contributions of all of its people rather than expecting any of us to give way for something called a melting pot. The next question is directed to Reverend Clegg. Uh, if there is no difference between your organization and that of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, why don't you join forces? Well, that's you know, kind of ridiculous question. There are differences between black Christian nationalism and Muslims uh, who have a Muslim position. I, we're willing to join forces with anybody who rejects integration and is willing to take a programmatic approach to the solving of the black man's problem. We have to understand that the black man is in, is, is in a slave culture. That's why so much of the talk that's coming out here is coming out of a slave culture where black people feel inferior, where the white man's declaration of black inferiority has been accepted by black people. That's why black leaders talk out of a slave culture whenever they open their mouths and their organizations, even when they've learned that black people have changed and they start to try to sound like they're opposed to integration, begin to talk in, in gobbledygook because they really are working toward integration and that's what they believe in. So it's, I would work with, uh, with Elijah Muhammad. He's, he's closer to trying to do something than most of these other organizations that are represented here with the exception of uh, Roy Ennis. Uh, I've just been uh, uh, informed that uh, Mr. Muhammad would like to respond to your comments. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, you may go ahead, please. Uh, please. Just a moment, I will. Thank you. You're on the air. No. It is too late. The next. The next question is for the panel from Reverend Leo Johnson in Las Vegas, Nevada. What do you envision as the major issue facing the black community? 
having identified the issue of all of the announced and unannounced presidential candidates, who do you assume would work to alleviate the problem? Obviously, you, that, we got to face one thing. That this, all the questions are grown out of the same uh, distortion of the truth. No president has any power. America is not run by presidents, but by people whose names are never even in the newspaper. They're run by a white institutional establishment, and the institutions control how people act. We've elected this president to keep us out of war, and this one to keep us out of war, and we stay in war because the president has nothing to do with any kind of decision. So for black people to be sitting around trying to pick a president who's going to solve the black man's problems is totally ridiculous. The black man's got to solve his own problems, and the president is not going to do it for him. Mr. Jordan, would you like to respond to that? I think that the, the basic answer to that is that black people have to say to the Democratic Party that it cannot take its vote and its power for granted. I think, on the other hand, that it has to say to the Republican Party that it cannot, in 1972, ignore the black vote. And I also think that if, in fact, there is a taken for granted on the part of the Democrats and there is a, an ignorance on the part of the Republicans, that there are clear options for black people in 1972 elections. Uh, and it seems to me that the Gary meeting uh, is, a, is an opportunity for black people to get themselves together and to deal with the question of of what those options are. Now, this question is directed toward the panel, and I hope you can be brief whoever answers it. From Richard Green in Cincinnati, Ohio. What is the opinion of the panel on busing to achieve school integration? It's ridiculous. I think that you can only receive quality education in light of our geographical uh, locations and where black people and white people live. Uh, through busing. I think that busing is very necessary to achieve integrated quality education. I would like to associate myself with that point of view. I do not think, as does Reverend Clegg, that it is ridiculous. I think that the issue is one of quality education. I think the issue is one of assuring black people an opportunity to equal educational facilities and consistent with the court decisions in Richmond and in the Charlotte Mecklenburg County case, I certainly put myself on the side of the issue of busing. I'm for it to I achieve. Let me agree with uh, agree. Reverend Cleeg and state again that it is ridiculous, it is insulting to black people to assume for one moment that for all these years white people have been given a good education. You know, the Kennedys have been going to their racially exclusive and isolated schools and becoming presidents. And for us to assume for one moment that b black kids must be bused into white schools to get a good education is nothing but racism by black people against themselves. Yeah. Self-hate. Let me just add quickly, Mr. Brown, busing in the concept in which I joined Vernon Jordan and Ralph Abernethy is not intended to be an exclusive process of busing black children into white schools. It is one of a number of devices which can be used and are being used and I hope will continue to be used to bring about quality integrated education. And uh, obviously, if one does not accept that as a goal, then busing is anathema. If one does accept that as a goal, then busing is certainly a legitimate means of achieving it and ought to be used and not disused. That's, that's not even the question. The question is education itself. Quality education does not necessarily mean going into a white school or where the, uh, the students are predominantly white. No school in America other than the Muslim school could be accused of teaching black children anything that would be helpful to black children. It doesn't make any difference whether you bust them out to an a exclusive white suburb or leave them in the ghetto. They're still going to be learning the same nonsense that has destroyed the black man's mind. The black man does not understand the whole question of power because he has been destroyed intellectually by white education and white education is not even touched by busing. Then maybe uh, we ought to bus the order. black, uh, we ought to bus the white students to the black <laughs> Muslim school. Uh, Dr. Cheek, you want that to That might be an improvement. Certainly for the white students it would be an improvement except it would sort of tear up the Muslim school. <laughs> I think a fundamental consideration is whether or not an inordinate amount of attention and energy have been devoted to the issue of busing and the fundamental issue of what kind and character and quality of education is being provided students um, has gone into the background. 
Um, I myself do not see the issue we face in those terms that are described by busing and its related phenomena. I think it's very important for the black population in America to disabuse its mind of the notion that the only way in which quality education, and by that I mean more than what is represented in how much one spends, but also what is the kind and quality and character of education is being provided, are far more important considerations than the question of what school one attends. Tony, I think, you know, that in a way we've taken a lot of time on this question, but there's no question more fundamental to describe the, the crisis in black America than this. Right now, today in Richmond, Virginia, white people in a conspiracy, conspiracy with a small number of black people are trying to disperse, further disperse black people. Just at a time when we are talking about group togetherness, group identity, black power social, political, economic. And it is important that we stay in this question a little bit longer than all of these panelists, because this is the first time in a hell of a long time that the black population outside here have been able to hear from its so-called leaders on this issue of school. Let everyone declare himself. Mm -hmm. uh, is I, he an integrationist? Yeah. Or is he a nationalist? Brother, is he for school I integration yeah. or for community control? Say it out loud. It seems to me that I, I certainly uh, appreciate that. That's a matter that of record and that we <laughs> ought to move to the next question. Yeah, I, I would like to, but uh, I, I think it, we, we also have responsibility to all of these people who are, who are calling us. We could certainly have a, a 90 minute program on busing. That's <laughs> as hot as you can get. But I, I certainly would appreciate if you keep your responses brief, and I'd like to move on. As a matter of fact, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would like to respond to Reverend Clegg. And uh, if, he is, if he can now listen to me, I, I would like for him also, if he can, to make his statement as brief as possible. Uh, you may go ahead. You're on the air, please. Mr. Muhammad? Yes. It is not too late for the black man of America to accept his own place in the sun as other nations have accepted their places. This is the best time for the black man that he has had since he's been in America to accept his own. The black man in America has been read by white people. Therefore, he don't know how to accept his own. But I'm here to tell him how to accept his own. God have made me for just that purpose. And it's not too late for him to accept his own. It is not too late for the black man in America to separate himself from white America. This must be done. The black man, I want to say to him, he's not too late to set up a government for himself. It is not too late for the black man to take over that which God has offered him to take over. And that is the whole entire thing. The whole earth belongs to the black man. Everything belongs to the black man but white man. He don't own white people, but everything else belongs to him. And it is time that he take it over. It is time that we realize the fact that we have been here 400 years serving almost servitude to slavery for all these years. And now for us to take and try and be shy of speaking up and taking over that which actually belongs to us by right of justice, it's making a fool out of us, ourselves. We can't take and make a fool out of ourselves for taking what is our own. This is our own earth. We made it. Our God made it. Our God now today want to give it back to us. And why should not we take it over? It is ours. 
everything is ours but the white man. He don't belong to us. And therefore, we should take that which belongs to us to be made mock of by white people just because that is in time that you accept your own and take over the whole entire earth and the heavens above the earth is only because that they don't like to be removed. But it is time and America's is first. Therefore, we black people must remember and must, must act upon the principles of this one thing, that we are the black people of the earth, the original people of the earth, the first, and we're not going to have in the last, we are forever. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to say that we accept, black Christian nationalists would certainly accept that position that, that, they, that he's uh, enunciated in this statement, and with one exception, that God's not going to do, do it for us no matter what name we call God by, that we're going to have to do it for ourselves. The, other, the, the historical aspect of his statement is absolutely correct. Thank you. Now, the next uh, question is uh, the similar question phoned in from three cities and three people, Curtis Richardson in Columbus, Ohio, Joseph Jackson in Boston, Massachusetts, and Ruth Scott in Manhattan, New Jersey. The question is to the panel. Can the panel function as a group in resolving problems for black people? No, the panel can't function as a group because the panel doesn't have any position. Most of the panel is integrationist, which is outmoded and obsolete and will tend to destroy black people. The members of the panel who believe in the black man building his own life, building his own nation, are separatists and cannot possibly function with a panel of integrationists. Integrationists are going to have to learn through the process of the white man's efforts at genocide that integration will not work. White people do not want to integrate with black people. Now, you can holler about if they will do this and if they will do that. White people are not going to integrate. They're not going to deal in terms of morality or moral values. They're going to deal as they've been doing in terms of the self-interest of white people. And as soon as black people learn that, then black people can begin to deal in terms of the self-interest of black people. I think the, the question is to the point of, uh, of functional uh, operational unity. I, it's impossible to function to together please, please. if you don't have the same position. How can a separatist and an integrationist who are both black function in terms of a white man who's out to destroy both of them? Mr. Barack, do you have any views I on that? I think uh, what I tried to say before is that what is lacking, just like what is lacking in our community, like is what is lacking on this panel, is the sense of trying to integrate the black community. Uh, in order to have a nation, to have a national consciousness, you have to have national integration. That is, you have to be able to move to a point of sophistication and maturity where you are able to take diverse groups within a national group. The one similarity that nationalists and integrationists have is that we're both black. And neither one of us, by our ideologies and philosophies, can erase that fact. So what we're saying is if we can bring about the integration of our own community and begin to create an institution of our own community, political development, and politics not meaning just voting, but politics meaning community organizing, making alliances and coalitions, developing the power to disrupt, and also being able to uh, uh, elect people to office. But by able to integrate, to bring together our community as one totality based on the fact that we are black people. And unless we are able to do that, bring our people together, then we'll never be able to make any movement because we'll always be working at cross purposes and against each other. Now, the fact that someone can say they're integrationist, and I know as well as you do that that is an absurd position to in, in, a, in a theoretical way, mm -hmm. you see, or a real way. But what I'm trying to say is this. I am not going to press the theory to the detriment of the reality. I would rather try to get black people together, you know, to solve all kind of diversity than to be so hung up on the theory of my own ideology that I would drive people away from me. That's beautiful, right. but what we've got to understand is one thing, that we cannot go along okay. with integrationists. We have got to, black people have got to drive integrationists, integration organizations, the black church and this integration thing, we have got to drive them out of the black community. Right, we can't put together a program that's dependent on dealing with black integration. They are the enemy. Right. No. Black integrations are just as much the enemy of black people as white people are because they are the lackeys of white people doing the, uh, the dirty work that white people would ordinarily have to do for themselves. Right, if, if we can, because we're running but very short of time.
may we, yes, may we, may we, may we house our philosophy in our responses to the question. Right. And I think that way we can see out of other people's ideologies, and because we only have, I think, 20 minutes. Mr. Jordan, you were trying to make a point, yeah, and then Mr. Gray. I think Gray. that it's, it's already proven to that, uh, in response to that question, that there are those of us on this panel, with the exception, I think, of Reverend Cleave, who have demonstrated, and demonstrate on a daily basis, that despite our differences and despite our divergent approaches and views, that we have found in various programs and in various situations, instances where we could come together and agree and work together. And it seems to me that that is, that is the only way that we can bring about some kind of unity out of our diversity. And I think the Reverend Cleag ought to understand that, uh, that those of us who do take a position of an open, pluralistic society, that we're not going out of the black community, that we're not going to be run out and that we're there just like the tree planted by the rivers of water. I mean, we have but one more I'm response. I'm wondering whether, you know, right. Mr. Jordan and the other assimilationists and degradationists would be willing to refrain from speaking exclusively for the black community, mm -hmm. recognize their two goals, and agree for us to function and possibly have a peaceful coexistence and reinforce each other's goal. The problem is the integrationist and conspiracy to silence the true aspiration and goal of most black people, which is that of self-determination. The you. problem no. is not the integration, the problem is the European. May, the we, may we please, I, I, I'd like but to. But the integration <laughs> serves the European. <laughs> right. Because it's it's lacking. But he does we, his job for see what I'm saying? Once we unify our community, then anybody who doesn't serve that community will be isolated and can be diminished in their, in their influence on our community by the totality of our strength. But you'll never unite Excuse the black me, community gentlemen. until you get gentlemen, black people please. who are Maybe. willing to reject we integration now have a live call, and start to build uh, a nation uh, for black people. For uh, Mr. Dick Gregory. Would you go ahead, please? Hello? Would you ask your question Hello? to Mr. Gregory? You're on the air. Uh, we're having difficulty there, too. We'll be back to it in a minute. Uh, you want to make a statement? Yes. I think, you know, many people have different ideologies uh, sitting here. But to the basic point of that question, I have nine kids. And the physical suffering that go on in this country, uh, I could leave this earth today and have no doubt that everyone on this panel could deal with all of the physical pain uh, without getting involved with ideology. Uh, there's no one on this panel here that couldn't deal with that in a very brilliant and honest and ethical way. Thank you. The next question is for uh, Ms. Height from Darlene Williams of Chicago. Please comment on black women and the women's lib. Well, black women have always had to fight for liberation. I think that uh, this question probably pertains to some uh, of the new thrusts towards liberation that have been uh, strongly pushed through white women. Um, seems to me that the, the one of the best examples we have today is the thrust of a Shirley Chisholm on the national scene, where black and white women are recognizing the need for the uh, the talents of women uh, to be um, fully expressed. And I think that black women have not been able to communicate only around the issue of personal development because we feel that our problem of liberation is tied up with the whole liberation of black people. So we have to work not only for the liberation of black women, but for the whole black family. But indeed, we are joined with all women in the struggle for liberation. Thank you. Now this will be another hot question to the entire panel. Whoever responds to it, I would appreciate brevity. From Phyllis Waller in New Orleans, Louisiana. How does a young black listening to this program comprehend the idea of being black faced with so many concepts? First, he, first the young person ought to read my book, Black Christian Nationalism, and that would answer all the questions and dispose of most of the arguments that the integrationists have brought up here. Well, if uh, the young fella cannot locate Reverend Clegg's book in It ain't hurry. hard to locate. Morrow, William Morrow published right. in New York City. If the young fella should happen to have difficulty locating Reverend Clegg's book and a great many bestsellers, are not always available on the shelves. They're being snapped up so fast that uh, they run out of them. I would say that his first job is to become true to himself as a person, an individual. He can do this, and it may well be through Reverend Clegg's book. He's got to know a great deal about his own past, 
about his own capacities, about the fact that the, 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 his blackness is not a limit upon him. Now, it's easy to say that. People have been saying it for many years. The actual achievement of it is far from being that easy or as simple as it sounds because it has to be twofold. He's got to know what the past was. He's got to know what he himself is, and he's got to struggle against adversity and make it. Nobody can achieve true manhood either by reading books or by engaging in philosophical dissertations or any other way except by struggle, individual struggle and group struggle. And that's what is ahead of this young man and all of our young men. Thank you. I should also think uh, that, that this panel is reflective of the fact that all of us are shaped in our ideas and our attitudes by our own individual experiences. And it seems to me that that young man must deal with himself, as John Marcel indicates, based on his own experiences. And I think he not all, only ought to read Reverend Clegg, but he ought to read Booker T. Washington and Du Bois and Malcolm, Martin Garvey. King and everybody else, Garvey, whomever. And based on that, it seems to me that he has, for himself and by himself, influenced by whomever might influence him, anybody on this panel, arrive for himself as to what he is, what he wants to be, and what his philosophy of life is. And I think that this panel is to a large extent reflective of that. I'd like to see him consider the black woman as his force. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And may I say this, that even more important in my estimation than all of this is the fact that we are all here this evening grappling with problems and working in the field of, of ideas. We're here because we are black. We're here because we are concerned. Certainly, uh, there is not uniformity, but I have a great feeling that there is unity, and we must find that unity. We're in search for that unity, and I think that that should ring clear in the mind of that young man that we are searching for that unity. We are searching for that truth. And if we keep searching, certainly we shall find it. All right, May this I, is, uh, yes. Briefly to the young man that we've all, this diversity is not unique to black people sitting here and no one else. In his life, he will find a choice of religions, which he can choose one of many, a choice of foods, uh, a choice of music. I think the ultimate end for this young man and, and most young people in America and the world over, you got to make a moral stand. And that ethic is what's going to be the guiding force. And in the total end, victory will be won because what we're really talking about, and all of us sitting here is talking about to relieve suffering of black people. Uh, the safest way we can all unify that is say, rally behind the moral force and the ethical power and we'll move. I'd like to say to the public, uh, we certainly appreciate their patience. We're dealing with as many questions as we can and as rapidly as we can. The next question is to Congressman Diggs. Uh, how relevant are President Nixon's policies to the black community today? Is he expected to get much support from black communities in his re-election bid? That's from the Black Audio Network in New York. Well, I think one of the uh, strategic uh, questions for black people uh, in 1972 uh, has to do with the political implications uh, of a presidential election year. And I think rather than uh, concentrate so much on the whole thought of uh, who we're going to support, uh, there are many people who are very much concerned uh, and are prepared to concentrate on unelecting uh, Nixon uh, as a goal uh, with uh, whatever combination of, of forces uh, uh, the, that can be exercised to accomplish that uh, based on the record uh, uh, of his uh, benign neglect uh, on a domestic uh, level and, and certainly uh, uh, crowned uh, by his, uh, uh, his attitude toward the emerging nations uh, in, in, in black Africa. We now have a live call I'd like to get on. Uh, we have a call from Boston. If you're on and can hear me, would you go ahead, please? to Congressman Dick's question, which the Black Congressional Caucus, Caucus plan to endorse Mrs. Chisholm as a presidential candidate? Uh, 
black convention plan to endorse as a presidential candidate? Well, the Congressional Black Caucus, as a matter of policy, uh, uh, does not endorse candidates. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, candidacy of, of, of Shirley Chisholm uh, is, is a matter of keen interest to all of us. Uh, there's no question that Shirley Chisholm's candidacy has, has raised the, the level of political aspirations of black people in this country. Uh, and there's no question uh, that her uh, impact in these uh, presidential primaries and uh, that she plans on entering uh, from Florida all across the country, uh, hopefully in my state of Michigan, uh, is going to uh, be a, a, a very uh, uh, strategic uh, uh, instrument uh, for brokering uh, black political aspirations for 1972. Thank you. This is a question from Miss J. Williams in Boston. Do you believe that it's possible that genocide will take place in America within the next 10 years, and will it be sanctioned by the government? Yes. <laughs> Very possible, and it will be sanctioned and led by the government. Thank you. The next question is for Dr. Cheek from Patricia Hammond in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. What is your opinion concerning the black intellectual, quote, brain drain from our black colleges, and how will this affect the black race in the next decade? I think the so-called brain drain uh, has been characteristic of what took place during a good part of the 1960s, but I think that there is some evidence to indicate that the brain drain is in the process of being reversed. There is certainly no question that the black institutions will depend upon black scholars if they are to pursue the goal of excellence that we alluded to in our opening statement. All right, the next question is for anyone on the panel from Aretha Johnson in Chicago. When will the, black, when will the white man be destroyed in America? When black people unite and start fighting uh, for their own freedom and the destruction of the white man really is a not, not relevant question. It's the, when will the black man build a nation and be able to control his own destiny? The next question is from Cheryl Rabford in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, how can we get white merchants out of the ghetto? How can we start an economic boycott? Just stop buying at white stores in the ghetto. That's very simple. If right. black people would stop buying, they'd have to leave. The whole question of, um, again, of control of the community uh, begins first with uh, a movement to unify all the diverse forces in the community to build some kind of power, political power, based on that unity and then to move to economic development. But um, as long as we are diverse and don't have a structure to deal from, a national structure that includes all the diverse elements to put together national black policies and national black agendas, you know, to deal as a quasi-governmental, quasi-national form and structure, then we will still be dealing with very small programs engulfed by a very large program. But the Barack has spoken continually about this national structure, and it's important, but the brother should deal with the fact that most of these national structures and national meetings called are called by the integrationists, assimilationists, to serve their own ends. And usually they include the rest of us, the nationalists, so that we can help further that end. Well, I think this, is, this ought to be known, is that the people sitting on this panel, if they are actually real, each have constituencies. So to say about an integrationist as if he were one person in the world, if you go out in our community, you will find that there are many, many, many integrationists out there, and many, many moderates, and many, many nationalists, and many, many Muslims, and many, many Christians. What I'm saying is we each have constituencies, but how to unite those constituencies so we have a nation, a national presence, a national political and economic strategy. And I don't think that nationalists are so weak-minded that they can be co-opted by uh, so-called... Gentlemen, can, can we move to some more way. questions so we can get out of the ideological argument? Uh, another question for anyone on the panel. Can black live under a capitalistic society? Shirley Waits in Philadelphia. Well, we've been living under it, but we, it's, it's a process by okay, which well. we die slowly. <laughs> we have not been living very well, and the black man is going to have to cease being purely uh, concerned with consumption and began to go back and build his own type of economic system, pull himself up by his bootstraps, 
give and service, work and doing the kind of communal thing that's now being developed in Africa called uh, Ujima, where communal work programs where black people contribute both money and time to build for black people. I right, put it this way, Tony, that uh, black man can live under capitalism, as uh, Reverend Clegg says, uh, he's been doing it. I think it's the one thing he and I agree on so far tonight. But there's also this to be said, that most of the white people who come after black people urging them to overthrow capitalism are anxious that they not enjoy any of the fruits of that capitalism. And I would say that when we have achieved, if we achieve, genuine equality in this country under capitalism, then we can all get together and decide whether we want to change it. I just don't want to see us made patsies by people who have ideological axes to grind. But I think it does mean that we have to be willing to examine the systems under which we live to see what kinds of change might make them more humane. And so that we would not have to have enough unemployment, enough racial discrimination, enough war to keep our system going. Change is really, it seems to me, what we need to examine and find a basis to move toward. It's very clear to me that uh, we do live in a capitalistic society. It's also very clear to me that uh, blacks are on the short end of the fruits and benefits of that capitalistic society. And it also, it seems to me, relates to the question asked by the young lady about should black business, should white businesses move out of the ghetto? It seems to me that another question should be, can black businesses exist on Fifth Avenue and Peachtree Street? Uh, and that seems to me to be a very basic question as Thank we you. look at the whole question of the capitalistic system. Very few system. minutes, and I'd like to uh, feel this one from Bernard Witt in Newark, New Jersey. Who is the most powerful black man in America today? No black man in America is powerful. There is no such thing. Uh, no, nothing exists that what you could call a powerful black man. There, there are black people who are projected by white people, but there are no powerful black uh, individuals because no black individual controls any organizational structure. There's no mechanism for us to determine that by since most black leaders are the creation of the white structure. Right. Uh, right. The question is almost impossible to answer, but I would suggest, uh, just for starters, a man that you don't often hear about, Andrew Brimmer. I would say a man who is a member of the Federal Reserve Board of Governors exercises genuine power over money in this country, and anybody who exercises power over money in this country exercises power. It may not be power exercised as some of us would like to see, but he is a man of power, and there are others. Thank He's you. a spook by the door, though. He doesn't There's, have any power. There will be no real... Um, total power for black people in America until there is some attempt to unify black America, to bring it together where it has one single consciousness and one single focus, you know, so that we're all acting collectively for the collective good. All right, speaking of that single focus, it ties into the next question by, from Joe Tech from Nova Scotia, Texas, for the Empire panel. Why can't we find one black leader or organization through which we can all join forces and unite in the common struggle? Well, That's the basic, basic that. black ridiculous <laughs> approach right. to the whole problem. Thank There's you. no such thing as any one black leader who's going to lead black people until black people reject integration and begin to put together a black nation with power. I black people have two sets of goals and aspirations. Until we identify those, we cannot talk about that kind of unity. Right. Thank you. The next question ties in somewhat uh, from William Reed in Plainville, New Jersey. Is there a common ground, then, that anyone can agree upon for the advancement of all blacks? Yeah, to get some power. Our powerlessness is the thing we suffer from. Either we escape from powerlessness and get power to control our own destiny, or we end up the victims of genocide. I think that there would be a consensus here, if that's possible, <laughs> that uh, the goal of political and economic empowerment on the part of black people is, is, a, is a desirable goal and hopefully an achievable one. I think that the difference comes as we, relate to how, as we relate to how we get there and the means by which it ought to be achieved. Thank you. This question, uh, Dick Gregory, I hope you can answer succinctly, from Ronald Webb in Washington, D.C. Do you feel that the U.S. government will use sickle cell anemia as a form of genocide? Uh, no, I think they use sickle cell anemia as a form of getting your attention off the real killers. Uh, we as black folks got to ask ourselves how many sickle cell anemia funerals have we been to compared to how many black folks that we know have died from lead poisoning and rickets and sugar diabetes and heart trouble and all of the other things, and from that point put it into its perspective. Yeah, yeah. This question uh, is uh, from Leroy Davis, Louisville, Kentucky, to Dr. Marcel. How can parents prepare their children when they are sent to schools where the thinking is not within a black spectrum? 
Well, whenever parents have a problem of a diversity between what's taught in schools and what the parents believe the kids ought to know, they have two possibilities. One is to find another school if there is one. If not, and this has been done successfully over the years, as witness this panel right here, we did not all learn the same things in the schools we went to. And the product of our minds today shows that other influences in school were at work. And in most of these cases, I would bet it was our parents who were able to exercise the kinds of influences they want. School can't do it all. The parents Thank you. must I can done. understand why that gentleman from Louisville, Kentucky, has a question. Because Mr. Morsell's organization has been successful in dispersing black people in Louisville, so much so that you can hardly find a black administration in school until this young man is able to go to school control by his people, he cannot get a good education. Well, Thank you. Way, Louisville I have a very direct question, uh, and this viewer would like a simple yes or no answer. <laughs> this is directed to Dick Gregory, Imamu Baraka, and Dorothy Height. Simple yes or no, are you for or against busing? I suppose I should say, or are you for busing? Yes or no. Mr. Gregory? I'm for it under certain conditions. Ms. Baraka? No, I'm not for it. I think it's an irrelevant question, actually. Ms. Height? I'm for busing and anything else that get, assures quality education. I think Thank that's you. an irrelevant question, though. The question should be, how can we create institutions to benefit our own people? You know, or control institutions how that our people are in. How can we gain do that? control of the public institutions like schools now? We only have uh, uh, two minutes left, one minute and the messenger would like to uh, make a uh, closing statement, and I hope he can make it brief because we're going off the air in a minute. Uh, Mr. Muhammad, can you hear me? If you can, uh, would you go ahead, please? Pardon me? Go ahead, please. We only have Would one minute left. Hello? Hello? Uh, we only have one minute left. Would you go ahead, please? All right. Uh, this uh, question, we're having diff technical difficulties with the phone. This last question, it has to be, which someone answered very briefly to the panel. What are we going to do about the forgotten black brothers in prison? We're going to work on prison programs at penal reform. We're going to try and change the whole system of the way we deal with crime and criminals. And we're going to see that uh, all largely black criminal populations are not watched over by largely white or all white guards, wardens, and other, and other uh, caretakers. A that's powerless step one. black people can't step do anything one. about the prison. This is we are doing that's, something that's, about that's it. That's an illusion that black people go through, that they can do something about the problem. I think also it's very important that we realize that at the heart of the problem is how do we keep them out of prison. And thank you very much. Racism yes, is and the that cause while we of it all. Right. And that while we're working for law and order, we have to be sure we're working for equality and justice. Thank you. Our time is out, and we would certainly like to thank all of you for uh, not necessarily an agreeable panel, but certainly a very interesting panel. And I think to some extent we have to reflect the diversity in the black community, which is very honest. Thank you again.